hollow it out. Yeah, you can press press your space bar and hollow that out, or put it in the chat box. Anything in particular you're hoping to to learn today? And I'll wait for a moment. I'm not seeing anything pop up. Okay, well, well let's begin with our some general comments around how. Okay, that looks like it's a partially partial sentence. How? What specifically? Is, is there more to that? I see how. Okay. How to be more confident. Okay, well, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and let me just jump to what I'll, I'll mention that now. So one of the ways I'd, I'd like you to be more confident is please recognize that your audience wants you to do well. Your audience is not your enemy. And I'm sure you've been in presentations where someone's not done very well. And I think, I truly think that's harder on the audience. Have you been in that situation where someone's presenting and they're really struggling? I think that's harder on the audience, right? You, you end up saying, come on, you can do it. <laughs> As an audience, we just want to learn something or be entertained. So I think it's an empowering thought to realize, look, your audience wants you to do well. They're not your enemy. They don't want you to fail. So that's one way to be more confident. We'll talk about other ways, but that's that's an important way to think about this. Your audience wants you to do well. Okay, we'll talk about communication skills. First, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm usually invited to speak in these sorts of venues because uh, I've been involved in Toastmasters since 1987, a previous century. Um, uh, and I was a very shy computer programmer when I joined Toastmasters, very shy, very awkward. And two gentlemen came to my desk and said, you know, if your career is gonna go anywhere, you need to learn to participate in meetings. And that was a great read because I'd be very quiet in meetings. I'd get outside the meeting room and I'd, I'd yak my buddy's ear off, complaining about how things weren't going right. So they knew I needed to learn to be confident and, and professional in communicating my ideas. So I joined St. John Toastmasters here in the city and, uh, and was reluctant to participate initially, but developed quite quickly in a supportive environment and progressed well in the organization. And in 2015, 2016, I served as international president for Toastmasters, so president of the entire organization. And I'll talk about public speaking and communication skills in general today and much about Toastmasters because it's just a, such a wonderful environment for developing your skills. So as international president, there's three roles, just one to serve as an internal ambassador and visit with some of the members around the world. Currently, we've got about 300,000 members and 15,000 clubs in 145 countries. We have four clubs in the city. Three of them are public. One's inside Canada Revenue Agency for their employees. So I served as an internal ambassador traveling to some great places in the world. I'll show you some photos on the next slide. I served as an external ambassador because a lot of big companies use Toastmasters as part of their development program for communication and leadership with their, with their employees. Uh, so I mentioned Canada Revenue Agency here in the city, Blue Cross in Moncton, uh, provincial government in Halifax and in Fredericton, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Royal Banks, the Scotia Banks, all the big banks, lots of big companies have Toastmaster clubs to support the development of their employees. So I would serve as an external ambassador to meet with some of those companies who had clubs or wanted to have clubs as part of their development program. And the third role was running the chairing the board of directors. So that's the business end of the not-for-profit organization. Um, so that meant chairing the board meetings and helping the staff manage the, the organization as it went forward in 2015, 2016. So those are some photos from our business meeting in Washington, D.C. in 2015, 2016, scheduled to be two hours long. It went for six hours long. It was not my fault. <laughs> we had some technology issues. It was a very long six hours. So next, this year in 2023, our business meeting and our big conference will be in Nassau, the Bahamas. I'm very much looking forward to that. So that was the role of international press. What I loved most was connecting with members. So I've got some photos here from Shanghai, from Mumbai, from Harare in Zimbabwe, um, just to give you a sense for some of the 
some of the places where we operate, where we've got clubs, we've got people working on their communication and leadership skills. And I still love to travel. I haven't done much of any since COVID, but to get back to that. Um, but just wonderful experiences at International President. Now, I tell you that for two reasons. Um, one reason is to present my credentials. You're here listening to me speak about public speaking and communication skills. So I want you to be confident that I've got a valid point of view. Um, serving as international president and a longtime member of Toastmasters gives me some of that credibility. Uh, so I want you to feel comfortable in my presentation today. But the bigger reason is I want you to become very professional in presenting your credentials. And I'd say especially as newcomers. If you're making a formal presentation or even a brief introduction to somebody, please don't assume that somebody understands your credentials, what your background is. Now, if it's a one-on-one -on -one environment, if you're just meeting somebody for the first time, you can present your credentials within 30 seconds. And if somebody wants to go more deeply, they can ask you some follow-up questions. If you're doing a presentation like this, still, you might only spend 60 seconds to 90 seconds. I think I've spent more than that time here because I'm making a point. When you're presenting your credentials, you don't necessarily need slides like I've used today. But I find in many cases, even with um, native uh, New Brunswickers, they make an assumption that people understand their credentials. So in making a presentation to a group of peers, you might say, look, I've worked for this company for five years. I've had these roles, served in these committees. It's been wonderful to be here. I'm pleased to present the point of view of my department and my colleagues here today. So it's a good practice to get into, get skilled at briefly, concisely, uh, professionally uh, asserting your, your, your credentials. That makes sense? Yeah? Okay. Next slide. I, I, I grabbed this because uh, I found this on the web recently. Just a, It's a long list, and I'll send this in PDF for, uh, format for you later so we can distribute it. But it's just some, uh, some general skills that this company recommends people work on to enhance their, their professional skills. And I'll mention you can work on all of these within a Toastmasters club, or I'm sure volunteering for the St. John Newcomers Center uh, or other organizations. So they recommend working on organizational skills, on communication skills in general. So presentations one to many, formal presentations, informal presentations, lots of dimensions to communication skills. They suggest working on your critical thinking skills, learning to analyze situations and uh, uh, in leading to on the left side, decision-making skills. Um, people need to be skilled at understanding pros and cons and options and ultimately making a decision. Emotional intelligence skills I find fascinating. Um, uh, so that's all about learning to give feedback and learning how to, uh, again, professionally and compassionately give somebody developmental feedback. And most of us, I think, have been in situations where we've got feedback that's very, very direct and a little brutal, perhaps. Um, there's, a, there's a way to give feedback so people don't feel damaged. Next, they talk about doing research and analysis, research and analysis skills, teamwork skills, working with various teams, self-management skills, and learning to have some discipline about how you approach tasks and your many responsibilities. And I'll mention here that I'm a member of Toastmasters. It's not my number one priority, but it's a priority. I spend time on it every week. So we need to learn as professionals to manage multiple priorities and, and give, uh, give all our responsibilities appropriate time. Uh, not everything can be seven days a week, 24 hour hours. It shouldn't be. That's unhealthy. But we need to learn to budget and manage our, ourselves. And on the bottom, they mention writing skills, which are important in most leadership positions, whether that writing is a report or an email or various other forms or a, a, a note of appreciation to a colleague or team member. And finally, they mention leadership skills. And I like this slide because it's a good general overview, I believe, of some professional skills. Uh, and I'm very pleased as well. People can practice all these things in a Toastmasters environment. So. As the day goes on, I will invite you to visit one of our Toastmaster clubs, one of our three public Toastmaster clubs in, in St. John. Uh, you may choose to join, and whether you choose to join or not, I'd like you to see and understand the professional development environment. 
uh, you may join or you will tell folks who need the service as, uh, as, as I did when I was a shy, awkward computer programmer. Um, so generally, whenever you're speaking about something, maybe you're going to be invited to speak at one of these events for the Newcomers uh, Association someday. Uh, I just encourage people to make sure you talk about things you feel some passion for. What are you thinking about? What are you working on? What are you dreaming about? Um, because sometimes people, when they're invited, do some research and they don't feel a passion. They don't feel excited. And 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 if you're talking about things you're not excited about, that's going to show in, in not a good way. It's hard to hard to be a great presenter if you're talking about something you don't feel some excitement for. So if you're talking, thinking about starting a business or fixing a social problem we've got in the city or helping other folks immigrate, those are the things you talk about. Find things you're you're thinking about, you're working on, you're dreaming about. What do you talk to your friends and family and colleagues about with any degree of passion? These are where speech topics come from. So I usually carry a little pocket, a notebook in my pocket, and I, I find myself if I'm excited about something and talking to somebody, I'll usually make a note about it. And I may use that in the future for a speech. I may not, but at least I'm cataloging some areas where I have some uh, some excitement. So in general, whether it's in Toastmasters or groups like this, talk about things where you've got some passion. As I said, I'd invite you to come to our Toastmaster meetings. This is one of my clubs. We meet, this group meets Tuesday mornings, 7.15 to 8.30. So then you can go start your work day and you'll be excited and full of uh, energy because it's you've taken some small risks in public speaking. You've had some laughs undoubtedly because most of these meetings are fun. Uh, this group meets hybrid on Zoom and physically at Connection Works. Another group meets Monday night from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And another group meets at, on Wednesdays from 12.15 to 1.15 at lunchtime. Uh, so all three meet at Connection Works in the Brunswick Square office tower. You have my invitation. Uh, connect with me if you'd like to more information. Love to see you visit one of our Toastmaster clubs. And here's a view of uh, some months ago, a smaller assembly. The, the groups are getting bigger now. It's nice. It seems like people have realized we're, while COVID has not disappeared, the worst of th the threat is beyond us. So people are starting to come out in larger numbers. That's the setup at Connection Works. And when you're public speaking, I'll give some 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 tips. One general tip I've sort of touched upon this, but capture your stories and your experiences. Uh, as I mentioned, I keep a little notebook to uh, to capture mine. But uh, I'm well practiced in these areas. Some of my experiences are working for 30 years for a telecom company called Align Telecom here in the city in marketing, lots of experiences around marketing. In the upper left-hand corner, I've got a photo of uh, my friends from L'Arche. L'Arche is a not-for-profit here in the city that does work with people with intellectual disabilities. So I've served as board chair and president for four and a half years. I was on the board for six years. Uh, so that shaped a lot of my experiences, a lot of the things I talk about, a lot of the things I feel passionate about. Uh, and I do feel a lot of passion for making sure we're connecting with other human beings and respecting them where they are, and particularly those who've got some intellectual disabilities or physical disabilities as they uh, work to uh, be productive members of our society. So Larsh has a home on the west side here for five people with intellectual disabilities. Five people with disability live with three people without disability. We've got an arts program down on Prince William Street, just down the door from the Newcomer Center, where many people with intellectual disability work with people without intellectual disability, and they just make art together. It's about community. And we're also starting a program called Support It Independent Living, where some people who need some level of support can live independently with the appropriate supports. So we've got three apartments going into that new building on Wellington Row across from the uh, liquor store on the, on the corner there. So um, that's that's one of the areas that shapes my experiences. So I hope you're just cataloging at some point your experiences. What could you talk about? What should you talk about in similar situations? Uh, and Toastmasters, of course, a big influence on my life in the lower left. 
And I've done some writing in recent years, written three books, written writing a fourth one now. I do some blogging. Uh, it's an important part of me and clarifying my thoughts and and understanding how writing helps my speaking, speaking helps my writing, helps me to help topics to emerge. So the key point on this slide, on your left, capture those stories and experiences. People love hearing your stories, learning about you, and we are all just some of our experiences. Now, in general, if you want to be a strong speaker or leader, and this applies to other areas of your life as well, if you want to be strong as a speaker, though, we're talking about communication skills, you need some knowledge, you need some practice, and you need feedback. So the knowledge about public speaking is about organizational techniques, it's about gestures, body language, vocal variety, how to use your voice, it's about eye contact, it's about connecting with your audience, about persuading an audience, lots of elements to knowledge and you can get the knowledge in many many places you can take a one-day course you can take a 13-week university course you can watch youtube videos you can watch ted talks there's read books there's all kinds of sources of knowledge so not but knowledge alone well knowledge alone will not make you a good speaker that's because what i'm doing here today this is a skill and public speaking is a skill and skills require practice so all the knowledge in the world will not make you a, a effective speaker if you're not exercising the muscle, if you're not exercising the skill. So point number two is you need a place to practice. This is a skill and you need to practice the skill. So if you're if you're a teacher, you're in front of students often and you're presenting often. If you're a salesperson, you're likely in front of customers often making presentations. Uh, so you've got a chance to practice a skill. But unfortunately, those folks don't get the third component. They don't get much feedback. Students don't offer a lot of feedback. Uh, customers don't offer a lot of feedback. Um, so you need a place where you can get some feedback. So you can hire a, a coach. You can find a mentor. Your friends and family will not give you very good performance feedback. <laughs> if you want to be strong at these skills, you need someone who will say, look, here's some areas you're very strong. Here's some areas you need to learn to manage a little stronger. I will tell you, I often get feedback about the speed at which I speak, which is something I need to continue to work on. Uh, I, I And I tend to manage that by pausing it more frequently. Perhaps you have noticed that or will notice that. It just gives people a chance to process information and catch up a bit. But you need that feedback on your performance if you're going to develop. Uh, so a good coach or mentor will tell you, look, do more of this because you're really strong at it. You're great at telling stories, et cetera. Uh, you're not so good at using your body to enhance your message. And you've got some distracting mannerisms. And you need that feedback if you're going to continue to improve. So I'm proud, obviously, in, in the Toastmaster Club, we'll provide you all those things. We'll provide you a base of knowledge about public speaking that you can supplement from other, so, with other sources. We'll provide you a place to practice on a regular basis. We'll provide you feedback from a variety of people in, in the room. Uh, and that variety is important. If, if I'm delivering a business speech and I'm getting a, a feedback from someone who's also deeply immersed in business, that's one perspective. But I like getting a perspective of somebody who's not terribly involved in, in the business world because we need to respect all members of the audience and learn how to make an impact with all members of an audience. So. Those are the three things you need. If you want to be a great speaker, you need knowledge, you need practice, you need feedback. And if you visit one of our Toastmaster clubs, uh, you will see the um, you see those things in action. And I'll mention now, is it because it has occurred to me that if you join the Toastmaster club, uh, it, it's the general costs are about two hundred dollars or less per year. So just uh, I'll plant that number in your mind. Um, but costs nothing to visit as the guest. And they all love having guests. We love exposing people to what we do in Toastmasters. Now, a little tip. My favorite speech structure for long speeches, for short speeches, a starting point for any speech for me typically is past, present, future. Uh, so that could be referring to this morning, lunchtime, and tomorrow when we're digging out of the snow. It could be 10 years ago. It could be... Uh, this decade, the 2020s, and the future could be the 2030s. It could be the time of the dinosaurs. It could be our current era and what the world looks like in the 
year 3000 when many people are living on Mars. So it's a, simply a structure, a planning structure. And it's particularly helpful when you're uh, caught off guard, if you're put on the spot. Very good for interview questions. Very good for introducing yourself to, to somebody. So past, present, future. If you ask me to talk about myself, I tell you about I'm semi-retired, 30 years with Bell Aligned, et cetera, et cetera. Past. Currently, I do some writing and some speaking for hire. Uh, I'm enjoying a semi-retirement. But my plans for the future are is I'd like to get better at taking some small risks and some investments to the better end of my community. That's where I'm going. Very brief structure. I hope you can see that past, present, future. So that could be a five to seven minute speech. That could be a 15 minute speech. It could be a 30 second speech, a two minute speech. It just provides a way to uh, put some structure to any answer. And I don't know if you have this situation, but back in the day when I was working in the big office tower for Bell Alliant, uh, Alliant Telecom, every once in a while I'd bump into one of the most senior managers and he'd say something. So like, Jim, you're working on a big project for us. How's that coming along? And I feel a little bit rattled, <laughs> but this structure helps in those situations. I'd end up saying something like, well, in, in February, Big Boss, we had a couple of nice successes, this and that. And as we work through March and April, there's a couple of items that are really important to us. And when I got really skilled, I'd say, you know, and as we move forward through the completion, we could use your help in these areas. So a simple structure, past, present, future. Um, so I view that it's almost a athletic routine, a sports routine. It's it's a position and approach. It's being ready to field a baseball or kick a soccer ball. It's a structure that has become a habit for me. And it can be a habit for you should you practice it. Um, so it works very well. And I'll mention you know, people receiving that message like it as well. And they, they're not sure why but it's because you've shown structure you've shown a logical approach it's easy for them to process and we need to make it easy for our audiences whether it's one person or 20 or 30 people we need to make it easy for people to uh, digest our message so that's a structure that always works now i'm not going to suggest you need to use it every time you can take other approaches to your speeches but this one it just works, especially when you're caught off guard. Um, so you might want to practice that this afternoon. It's a nice little structure that you can use at any point. And I'll offer some quick tips. I already touched on this first one. You know, you, you were at, you asked how can I, I, someone asked, how can I be more confident? I'll, I'll, I'll expand a little more on that. But do understand your audience does not want to watch you be uncomfortable up there. They want you to do well. So put, keep that in your mind. They want you to succeed. Uh, and they're not your, your enemy. They're not looking for you to fail. So that's. Uh, I hope you find that empowering. And I'll say some more about being confident. And this one relates to number two. So when it comes to your content, I, I, I like to work with people and make sure they know exactly what they're going to talk about but not exactly what they're going to say. And I've been through these phases early in my speaking career. I would memorize a lot of material. I might have 50 sentences in a speech. And I come to a point where I'm working on sentence number 12, and I can't remember sentence 13. I can remember 14, 15, and 16, but it's like missing a piece of a puzzle. And I just did not know how to connect. And that's the danger in memorizing. If you lose a sentence, you're... You're lost. You don't know where to go in your speech. And a second danger is that you may have seen people do this. They memorize a speech and they get up and they're reciting it. And it looks like they're reading off the back of their eyeballs, right? They're not making eye contact with you because they're working so hard to memorize the precise words. So I really encourage people, you know, pre know precisely what you're going to speak about, not exactly what you're going to say. And I think that takes some practice to learn to um learn to get to a point where that's comfortable. I was actually working with a, a client this morning and we were going through his approach and he needs to write out a speech, but then he needs to break it down so that he can just generalize the components. So component one, uh, you know, if you were asking me about Toastmasters, we're talking about Toastmasters. I might tell you how the organization got started. 
um, where it was when I was international president 2015, 2016, uh, what the ambitions are for the next five years. So there's components that I can easily speak to for 90 seconds to two minutes. And I can know precisely what that structure is. I might have a little index card or a piece of paper to jog my memory of the four or five points. And I can speak to them with confidence. I'll know precisely what I'm going to talk about. I can look and see precisely what I should be talking about, but not the precise words. Now, there are times if you've got a very controversial speech, you might need to write out every word and present it. But that's not the best way to engage with, with an audience. It's it's best to have eye contact and, in my opinion, to appear that you're just conversing with, with them. You're just having a nice conversation. So for content, know precisely what you'll talk about, not precisely what you're going to say. If you're focused on the precise words, the precise sentence you're going to use, you're going to feel nervous. You're going to think, oh, what if I forget something? I want you to get to a point where you're confident, you know, what you're going to talk about and not the precise words. So those are a couple of tips on being more confident. This one, third one as well, I suppose. Uh, I like to arrive early. If we were meeting face-to-face, -face, I would have been in your room early and meeting some of you and just connecting with some of you. I'm sure we've got some things in common. I might prefer them during the speech. Um, I'd ask you, you know, what you want to get out of the, the presentation. That might inform a, a, a manner in which I shape the, the presentation. Um, but it's it's great to arrive early, chat with some audience members and, and make friends. I'll mention as well on, on bigger stages, it's important to get there earlier. You want to know, is there is there a microphone? And that might be the situation that you encounter in some cases. And if there's a microphone, you should use the microphone. You might think your voice projects well, and your voice may well project well. But if an organization has invested in a microphone, they likely know that their room swallows sound, that it makes it hard for people to hear. So arriving early, you can check all that out. Is there a microphone? Is there a sound guy? Do they want to clip a microphone on your jacket or your, your dress or your, your, your blouse? Um, you want to be there early and, uh, for those reasons. But additionally, just to, to make some friends. And if you're feeling nervous, it's nice to just step out on the stage and look and smile at Olga and Olga smiles back and you feel good and confident and off you go. So sometimes I have gotten this question about VIP guests. Some, some folks have had to host some very important guests at functions and they say, well, I feel nervous and in interacting with them. Uh, so here's a suggestion for those situations. Uh, just again, arrive early. Um, when you're if, if, if you're taking care of the VIP guest in any capacity, uh, just just ask them some open-ended questions. How did you get involved with the Newcomers Association? How did you get involved in Toastmasters? What, what's your interest in the organization? Some open-ended questions and let them talk. People, if, you, if you're skilled at, at asking open-ended questions and letting people talk, they will think you're a great conversationalist. The other person might del deliver 90% of the content of your conversation. They'll think you're a great conversationalist because they were able to easily converse with you. So with that, I'm going to stop and open it up to questions. Should there be any places to delve deeper? There's some other um, material I could go into, but I, I'd like to stop here. And actually, I'm going to stop the share. Anybody have any questions about this? Nobody? Uh, okay, I will check our chat box. Yeah, at the meantime, actually, I can speak a little. I don't have any question, but I see, I think you really make a point of uh, what we can do uh, in the public uh, uh, talk, public presentation, like uh, just arrive earlier and try to chat with uh, the audience there. Because sometimes what I have done before, I will wait exactly at that time. Like I have a meeting at 12, <laughs> I'm gonna be there exactly at 12. And, uh, but before 12, I'm gonna be super nervous about like uh, doing the preparation scene. But uh, that's a really good recommendation to go there early and to chat a little bit more. It can help us to uh, relieve some of the stress and the better understand uh, what we can talk later on. Yeah. 
Very good. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, so we have a question. Everything is about the power of voice because uh, it's like a part, everything is about the power of voice. It's like a part of confidence. And so the question, how to be more confident uh, to talking in public, you know, not to be scared because, uh, okay, when you are uh, passing some uh, interview, you are in the room with the known uh, people and you know that uh, uh, your future will be uh, depend on their decision. And uh, uh, you know this kind of shyness and confidence, and then when you're like in a stressful situation, yeah. So maybe you can share with the tools and or some exercises, you know, how to enhance these skills before the interview, how to prepare yourself, you know, not to mm -hmm. be lost. Sure, I'd say a couple of things. One, I, I I recommend practicing before your interview with a friend. Just invite them to ask you some awkward questions, some good questions, some typical interview questions tell me about yourself what's your what's your experience tell me about a situation where you didn't disagree when you didn't agree with your boss ask get a friend to do that and give them feedback uh, but additionally i'd say practice some sort of structure and i mentioned my favorite is past present future if someone asks you a question and you're not sure where to go tell me about a situation where you um if someone asked me, what's the situation where you didn't agree with your boss? I'd say, well, gee, I spent 30 years in the telecom industry and marketing and sales. And it, it, as I'm saying that, as I'm giving some background, it's given me time to think. And I'm using my structure that I'm so comfortable with. And in a sense, I, I, I would say I'm, I'm killing time. I'm using time to provide some useful background that jogs my memory and allows me to answer. And I, I suppose... In my example, if I did, couldn't come up with an example where I had a awkward situation with my boss, I'd need to say, you know, I, 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 as I think about that through all that career situation, uh, I can't come up with a good example for you. Apologies. But getting familiar with the structure, is, I think, is very helpful. That's why I love past, present, future. It, 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 the more comfortable you are shaping things in that manner, the easier it is to to uh, to to respond so a couple of thoughts there is that good right. yeah thank you uh jessica you have some comments do you want to share yes um i just want to share that um i guess for me it's no it's not a problem to speak in public mm. even in my well even in english Mm. The thing is, sometimes when I want to express express some ideas, I just mix all the words, all the ideas, because of the nervous. Mm. So, Jim, I don't know what will be your um, uh, suggestions for that, because um, I try to follow uh, the suggestion that you mentioned before, mm. and you mentioned that when we were at, at Prud. But still, I'm struggling with that, uh, especially when I have to talk with my supervisor. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's so I, I think it comes down to experience. Um, it, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's simply will, uh, being willing to, to stick with it. And, um, you know, I respect, I, I just love folks who join our English-speaking Toastmaster clubs and speak in a second language. Most people are afraid to speak in public in public to start with, and then to speak in a second language. That takes uh, a, a lot of confidence, a lot of bravery. So so wonderful on that. And I hope you always find an audience who's respectful and and and, and wants to hear your message. You know, that's the, the job of the audience. It's to be respectful and and try and understand. And I meet so many newcomers who who say, you know, my English is is not good. And 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 for most of the folks I've met, your English is is fine. You, your accents are different, and they're not. That's not that's not a bad thing. But the accents are different, and the accents here in Atlantic Canada are different from Alberta and Ontario and British Columbia. Everybody's got an accent. Um, so I, again, I'll point to Toastmasters as a place where you can come and uh, practice skills and and. You know, Canadians are pretty polite, I think. And if someone says yeah. pronounces a word slightly incorrectly, uh, we we're not going to typically comment on it. But I find a lot of newcomers say, "No, look, look, I I I want to 
improve my pronunciation and my I want to change my accent a bit to uh, sound more local so we can help shape that that's not formally part of the program but if people are upfront about their their goals and aspirations we can shape that so yes I, I just say I think it's experience um mm -hmm. and I, I'm sure your supervisor has got respect for your message so so just keep at it and I'm sure you're going to do great Thank you, Jim. Yeah, and I just want to let you know that I'm going to join your team, okay? So oh, that's great. Yes, I couldn't hear uh, what was the cost, but at the end of the presentation, we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. Did you say the cost? Yes. Oh, I want to address it now. I, I just I hate to let things wait. <laughs> okay. I'd like to get things done immediately. So, yeah, the cost, it, it varies by what point in the year you join. It's based on what we send to our headquarters in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So right now for most of the clubs, it's probably about $120 plus a $30 new member fee till the end of September, which is one of our payment periods. So that's generally, generally at this point, if you've never been a member of Toastmasters, probably around $150 to join till end of September. Okay. Thank you. Jim. Great. We'd yep. love to see you out. Great. Thanks. Anybody yes. else? Yeah, no question. So I have a question, Jim. Sure, okay. uh, yeah, and I'm also uh, going to join the club, really. I'm so <laughs> excited about everything. I was going there and they were like meeting uh, like uh, twice per week. Yeah, we have these meetings. Uh, well, there's uh, there's three public clubs in the in St. John area, and one at Canada Revenue Agency. Each mm -hmm. of them meet weekly, but they okay. are clubs. So members people people typically join one club and they go mm -hmm. monday night or tuesday morning or wednesday lunchtime mm -hmm. so we will uh, keep this whole information here uh, in emails and we'll share with our attendants to have it here okay. i will yep yeah so great so and i have a question uh so um what is will be your suggestion yeah how to make people feel like they are the only one in the room when you are talking with them for example if you are making some presentation yes mm -hmm. And um, you want to have uh, all this, their attention mm -hmm. and not to lose it, you know, because sometimes uh, maybe they are not uh, uh, not um, too much interesting in the topic, but you have to make this presentation and mm -hmm. uh, you want to make it great, you know, and uh, uh, to have their attention. So Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that comes down to... There's a couple of elements there. One is uh, one is simply the skills and experience being being a good presenter. That that takes practice. Uh, something I like to do, and I didn't do it for this presentation, but when I'm invited, I'll usually connect with the person who invited me and you know try to suss out uh, to uh, assess you know what is the skill level and interest in the in the the, the audience. So what, what's important there is trying to understand, look, are they are, do they have some expertise or little expertise? Because if they have a lot of expertise and you covered basic things, they're going to get bored. And if they don't have much expertise and you talk at a high level, they're going to get bored. So that's one level of keeping them engaged. But there's some other tips and techniques you can use. Like One of the things I like to encourage people to do, uh, some people... Some people are very logical and they present and they think everybody in the room is very logical and they just logically lay out their their speech. But there's a couple of things you need to do. One is just mix in some emotion. Tell a little bit of a story. It doesn't need to be a long story. So, for example, if you were presenting on the New Newcomers Association, you just don't want to talk about the numbers and the process. Da, 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 da. You want to talk about the impact it's had on some people's lives. It's just a 60 second to two minutes on the impact that's the emotional side so you're appealing to people's logic everybody thinks they're logical and rational but you want to talk about that impact hit them with the emotion as well and there's also just some approaches around repetition and and amplifying key points um, to say things like you, know, you take them through some material and say key point here is just make sure they land it and it, we have to respect that our audiences are busy they're distracted folks here on this call today are thinking about what happens at one o'clock when they go back to work so we need to sort of frame it up um so one of the approaches in public speaking it's a cliche but it works is tell them what you're going to tell them tell them tell them what you told them and when i first heard that I, I thought that's demeaning to audiences audiences are smart they can figure things out but no 
No, they're distracted. Everybody's distracted these days. So tell them, you know, here's my point today. Take them through your material. And then at the end, just to bring it home, say, you know, I, I hope you got these are the three key points for what we're going to do to improve our situation. So tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. Tell them what you told them. Because uh, for most people in the audience, they will drift away at some point in the in the presentation. So some repetition, some landing of key points is important. Thank you. Uh, so we have one more question from Abraham Thomas. Uh, how to overcome dissertation while standing up to speak become blank? I mean, any tips? Or can you repeat that? I missed yeah. the first part. Uh, how to overcome the situation while uh, standing up to speak become blank? Yeah, I'd say I go back to that tip about know exactly what you're going to talk about, not exactly what you're going to say. So in most presentations, I'll have a I'll have a list in front of me, the four key things I'm going to talk about. And I'll stand up. And I guess I can't relate. I have gone blank before, but it's been a long time. But if I did go blank, I just look at that. Right. Point one is to describe our situation. Point two is to describe option number one. Point three is to describe option two. And point four is my recommendation. So, so it's okay to take some some notes up there. Um, you know, you're. Uh, there are times where some people I find just want to be a presentation superstar. Um, but your your responsibility is to land a message with an audience. So if you need some notes, take your notes, and that should give you confidence and something to fall back upon. Okay, great. Thank you, Thomas. Mm -hmm. So um, how it's possible to develop um, emotional intelligence? Is it oh. possible? I was thinking it's like, you know, like interpersonal skills that we, we are born with this. <laughs> yeah, I think it, I think it is. And uh, I'll mention in our Toastmaster group, one of the, there's four main things that happen in a, any Toastmaster meeting. One, a group of people plan and organize the meeting. So it finishes at, within the hour or two hours, whatever scheduled. Some people deliver prepared speeches. So they've planned speeches and got up and delivered before the audience. A third component is they learn to think on their feet and we give them a question where they can't they can't be prepared and they need to answer a question for a minute or two. But the fourth component is giving feedback publicly or privately uh, to uh, to uh, somebody. So that's a place where you can observe people um, displaying emotional intelligence and develop your own. So for example, um, when we when someone first joins, you know their speech might not be very good. Uh, and uh, the evaluator is not going to stand up and say that directly. They're going to coach their language in ways to acknowledge the things that did go well. And that might be simply standing before the group and getting their, their first project done and, and giving them some developmental feedback, some ideas for how they can become more strong. So by observing that and by participating in that, by receiving that sort of feedback, um, you can develop your emotional intelligence. And when somebody sits down and, and says, oh, gee, my, my, that, I was awful. My speech was awful. And they get positive feedback and somebody acknowledges some good things they did and gives them some suggestions, that that's transformational. Okay, yeah. And what about uh, critical thinking? How critical to develop thinking. this critical, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of elements to that uh, and a part of it is relates to the to the evaluation portion of those those meetings but that's when you need to look at uh, you know what was the speaker trying to accomplish and any any toastmaster speech there will be a set of objectives that we're asking people to work on whether it's persuading an audience or using vocal variety so a simple assessment for critical thinking is being disciplined around saying okay if that's the objective uh, am i hearing examples that in seeing examples to tell me that that was delivered so that's one way to develop critical thinking um, there's also the element of deciding whether you agree with the point of view and how you express it or don't so many elements to critical thinking okay thank you for your answer we have one more question in our uh, chat box mm -hmm. so carlos is asking how important really is to include some storytelling personal experience in speeches personally i found that it helps to connect with this with the speaker at least uh, from my side uh, 
from this from my side in the audience what is the recommendation regarding storytelling yeah well if you're in a formal business situation say in a boardroom or making a formal presentation in that manner a, a story might not be appropriate but in most cases it it, it still can be um, but for most audiences we relate best to stories as we've been using stories from way back in time confucius and aesop's tales uh, so yeah in most situations i will try to tell some some story and it needn't be profound it could be a customer service experience that, that you had uh, um, uh, relatively recently it could be really rather trivial but people were late people were late to stories so that's that's kind of the mix it's you decide whether kind of an emotional appeal with a story or some rational support and, and and you keep on varying those things so you're appealing to both sides you know lots of uh, lots of great experiences and stories around customer service so in most speeches a story is entirely appropriate thank you carlos yeah, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, so maybe you will give us some advices um, how uh, to pitch yourself uh, during some networking events. You know what I mean? Yeah. How to pitch it in the best way, you know? Sure. Yeah. Uh, my my routine when I'm in a networking event, I have to confess, I don't typically enjoy networking events, but I work at them. It's some of that self-discipline, self-management. Uh, so I'll usually look for somebody when I first go into the room, if I see somebody I know, that's fine to go talk to them. But I'll usually look for someone who's standing alone. And I'll go over and say, uh, hello, um, I'm Jim. Uh, what brings you to the event? Open-ended question. What brings you to the event? They might say, my husband dragged me here. Or my boss told me to come. Or I'm interested in what's going on with the Newcomers Association. An open-ended question invites them to... Uh, to share some information and you might need to probe a little further but that's my routine that's my tip uh, always open it a question and typically it's what brings you to the event today okay thank you it's nice advice and uh, i know it's also very important to know how to ask questions like right questions yeah so any advices, you know, when you're, I don't know, just met a person, for example, in some networking event, yeah, you just um, introduced to each other. So, and um, you need to uh, ask here yeah, some questions. Yeah, and so that's, that's my starting point. Typically, what brings you to the event? Um, they might say, you know, look, it's related to my work. So another good open-ended question is, Oh, tell me more about that or some variation of that. Oh, I'd like to know more about what you're involved in there. Open-ended questions that invites them to talk. Okay. So, what question what questions are forbidden that you can't? What's answer? forbidden? Yeah, forbidden, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I'd say things like asking about how much money they make. Um, yeah. Uh, even things like so, uh, it's a little awkward sometimes, you know, where do you live in the cities? And sometimes people ask that, but some people can feel a little awkward with that. I don't think most of the forbidden, I think, is obvious, but I have found some cultures will ask, you know, how much money you make. And it's a, it's a question of respect, right? Oh, you're a very important person. You must have a big salary. Um, that's not a question that works very well in, in North America. So obviously things like you know sex religion politics yeah this is yeah this is like everywhere yeah yeah Obviously, everywhere yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i saw there was a question if we want to speak about a profession like a professional speaker mm -hmm. i'm going to open the chat as well if we want to speak as a professional speaker we should use high vocabulary and high grammar or don't matter let's see well you you always need to respond to your audience and i'm more in favor of of, of simple words but also descriptive words so the you know we don't want to overuse particular particular words um so so it's, it's good if we've got some variation and can use some inspired choices uh, but but a presentation need not be 
all or heavily populated with complicated words, but a few inspired words, I think, can, can uh, help how people perceive you. But, you know, you, and you might need to test with the audience, you know, not not you understand the word, but is my message, is that message clear? You, you don't want to ask that too many times, but as you become skilled as a presenter, you learn to watch the audience and you look and see if somebody looks puzzled and you might want to say, can I make that more clear? Does that make sense? And those sorts of questions that invites the audience to ask for clarification. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. And... Is that a question for the starting? Some free training will be best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If that's related to Toastmasters, I would say, again, come and experience the environment. Find out if it's the right environment for you to develop in. Um, observation, you can observe how people are skilled and start delivering some short speeches and get into the more meaty stuff as if you choose to join. And as I, as I mentioned, in a, you know, three things you need. You need knowledge, you need practice, you need, you need feedback. You know, training is great. Training delivers knowledge, typically. Uh, this is, you need experiential, you need experience, uh, the, the exercise, the skill to, to, to develop. So I really encourage that participation, find opportunities to plan a speech, deliver a speech, realize eh, that didn't go exactly like I, like I planned, but it was still pretty good. Yeah, yeah, sounds great, yeah. Samir? Shamil? Yeah, any yeah, questions? So Yes, hello, Jim hello. and everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, thank you for interesting topic. Um, actually, I was uh, invited to Toastmasters Club in Istanbul mm. for several times as a guest. Yes. Mm. And uh, I've noticed some interesting tendency, like uh, in the part of the giving the feedback, uh, some people like friends, uh, quite modest to give uh, real feedbacks in front of others and etc. Uh, how do you usually deal with this? Because as you mentioned, the feedback is one of the vital parts of the speaking and public speaking, especially. Thank you. Mm. That's a great question. Yes, yeah, so one of the things I'd recommend, should you join a Toastmaster Club or even in your professional organization, your company, uh, look, to, look to find a mentor. Say to someone, let's use the Toastmasters as an example. It's like, look, I'm going to um, join this club and I know I'll get feedback from many people. I really like your style, your approach. I can learn from you. Would you make it a point to pay attention to my speeches and my performance and give me feedback from time to time, aside from those who are assigned? So whether that's in your company or in your Toastmaster club, Find somebody who you, you'd you like to get continuous or, or frequent feedback from and ask them to do that. And they will give it to you privately, I would expect. In a private way, uh -huh, I see. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, that's simple and sounds <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not as simple to execute, but it's a simple uh, way to describe. <laughs> because it, it, it is difficult to go to someone, I think, and say, hey, I like your style and I can learn from you. And, um, would you mentor me in some fashion? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. How are we doing, Olga? Yeah. Any questions, Guy? One more. Someone is asking about uh, would you recommend uh, some materials uh, all, um, online, such as Dale Carnegie training? For I starting. Yeah. Sure. I'd invite you to visit www.toastmasters.org. That's our international site. It's in 11 languages, various aspects oh, of it. Great, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, uh, that will give you some background and opportunities to pursue some other material. Uh, yeah, so that's a tremendous source. Okay, great. So guys, our session comes to the end. And uh, thank you, Jim, so much that you shared with your experience, with your amazing background. It was an honor to have you like our uh, trainer and lecturer today. 
So we will share with all information with the roster of uh, Toastmaster, uh, Toastmasters uh, uh, groups uh, in our email. In our, I will also send you our survey forms. Please fill it. We need your feedback. As Jim told, it helps us to improve. <laughs> Um, and uh, I remind you that you can contact uh, our pre-employment pre team, uh, Tavia Han. I uh, will um, leave her email uh, also in the um, post um, letter. Uh, she the head start to employment navigator program, and Leonardo she is profiling. He he's, he he running a profiling project, and I'm uh, running the connecting plus program. So you will get all the necessary information. You can contact us and also follow our social media, and you will be updated with the next info session. So thank you so much, everybody, for your participation. Have a nice day. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane.